Excellent! What's up everyone, welcome to Paul's Hardware. If you've been watching my channel in the past couple weeks, you will know that I have been doing a beginner's guide to building a computer, upgrading a computer, setting up that computer properly by installing Windows, setting up stuff in the UEFI BIOS, and making sure that like, if you have an added extra hard drive in there that it's working properly. And now finally, I'm doing what everyone should do with their newly built computer, which is to see how freaking fast the darn thing is, because when you build a computer, you kind of want to see what the performance is like. Anyway though, if you want to check out any of the videos leading up to this one, including the how to build a computer, beginner's guide, the how to upgrade a computer, also a beginner's guide, as well as the how to do everything after that, also a beginner's guide, available via the playlist linked in the video's description, also posted in the card right up there. Please check those out, share them with your friends if they've never built a computer before, and hopefully we can spread the love with this computer building thing, because PC gaming is a heck of a lot of fun, and getting in on the ground floor, even if you're building just a $500 system, I think you can get a lot of bang for your buck, as will be shown very quickly here as I move on with the benchmarks. So the benchmarks are gonna be run at 1920 by 1080. I think that's a very reasonable uh, resolution to be playing at if you're building a system like this. The $750 system, I think, would be a great option for anyone who's considering transitioning over to 1440 resolution gameplay, but if you don't have the monitor, keyboard and mouse, and Windows licenses for the system, bear in mind those aren't included with the cost, so you are going to need to spend a little bit of extra money on those, and I've posted links to where you can get Windows for fairly cheap via kingwin.net down in the description. Uh, you can also buy Windows for full price if you're paranoid of kingwin.net. I've also posted some examples down there of a uh, mouse, keyboard, and monitor that you could use with this system. Let's get right into the benchmarks though once again. 1920 by 1080 is the resolution I'm running these at. 3D Mark Fire Strike Extreme is our first benchmark. This is a synthetic benchmark, but a great way to get a initial comparison of your system's performance compared to other systems' performances. The $500 build scored 2,371 overall, 2,499 on graphics, 6,105 on the physics tests, and 1,032 on the combined test. Upgraded to the $750 build, we have 5,678 overall. 6,421 on the graphics, 6,607 on the physics, and 2,732 combined. That's a pretty big jump, especially if you're looking at those overall scores and the combined scores. That is the impact of both jumping up to a quad-core uh, processor from a dual core, as well as jumping up to a graphics card that costs in the $250 range as compared to our entry-level uh, RX 460 graphics card, which costs around $110 to $130. 3D Mark Time Spy is next. This is another synthetic test focusing on DirectX 12 performance. The $500 build scored 1,793 overall, 1,730 on the graphics, and 2,261 for the CPU. $750 build scored 4,064 overall, more than double the score, 4,203 on the graphics, and 3,423 on the CPU, so some pretty impressive gains all around. Moving on to GTA 5, very popular game. I love playing it whenever I get the chance. The $500 build on the built-in benchmark scored 38.1 average frames per second and a minimum of 15.8. Since 38 frames per second isn't exactly the best average frame rate, I mean, above 30 is okay and playable, but you really want above 60 if you can manage it, I decided to play around with some settings, and I found that by turning MSAA off and setting most of the settings in GTA 5 to high or normal, I was able to achieve 60 to 70 frames per second playable frame rate, so that's really what you'd want with 1080, and you can still totally play it, just higher normal settings. It's not even that much of an impact on the actual visual impression that you get of the game. The $750 build scored 96.1 average frames per second in the built-in benchmark. 10.2 was the minimum, which is a little bit disappointing, but uh, minimums can bounce around a lot. I found that live gameplay using these same high-resolution benchmark settings still got me 90 to 95 frames per second on average, so just fine for 1080 gaming, even at the highest settings you can do, and I would imagine that even if you jumped up to 1440, you could still get yourself around 60 frames per second. Moving on to Overwatch, uh, these benchmarks were run at ultra settings, not epic like I usually do. I found the $500 build scored 69.7 average frames per second, 54 minimum. Totally, totally fine for playing Overwatch at 1080. $750 build, 181 average frames per second, and 146 was the minimum. Again, a huge boost, and it's really cool to see that with just another $250 invested in the initial system, we're seeing double and sometimes close to triple the frame rate that you get, especially if you're playing a game like Overwatch, which isn't quite as GPU-intensive. But 
that really high frame rate, 181.1 average frames per second with a $750 build would be very appealing to someone who wanted to get a fairly budget system, but then invest a little bit more in a monitor that did say 120 or 144 hertz refresh rate. Get yourself really fast, smooth gameplay. You don't necessarily need a hugely powerful system to do that with a game like Overwatch, but it's still possible. So that's good to know. CSGO is up next. This is another game that is not terribly intensive to play when it comes to the GPU that you need. A lot of people are interested in playing CSGO at really high frame rates. I'm happy to say that the $500 build was consistently up in the 150 to 180 frames per second range. Bear in mind that I have no idea how to play CSGO personally, but I did run around and pretend for a little bit. Um, so that's really nice, especially if you're going with, an, again, a high refresh rate monitor. $750 build, Improved on that, it wasn't quite as much of a jump as we saw with the other games. I was seeing 150 to 170 at minimum, but uh, oftentimes it was hitting 200 frames per second and even giving, getting up to the 220 and 230 range. So very good performance there as well. Finally, we have Doom, and I tested Doom using Vulkan rather than OpenGL, and uh, I did it a different way. So I'm running at 1080, but I decided to test it at low, medium, high, and ultra using just that intro sequence so I could compare them side by side and see what the frame rates were. So what have we learned from these benchmarks? Well, I learned that the $500 build easily was able to handle 1080 gaming at medium to high settings, as well as high frame rate gameplay in less demanding games like CSGO and Overwatch, which I thought was really cool. I mean, most of the time, if you consider a budget build like $500 or less, you think like, wow, you're really gonna have to turn the settings way down in most games, but it actually performed very well as long as you're playing at 1080. $750 build shows how much of a boost you can get by spending just a little bit more. With a quad core and a $250 price range GPU like the GTX 1060 in here, gets you high to ultra settings at 1080, and then again, allows you to easily transition over to a 1440 monitor if that's something that you're considering doing in the future. Now, as far as temperatures go, that was a big concern here, and I'm happy to say that my addition of this extra fan made a pretty big difference. The $500 build tested as is, uh, the CPU hit 64 degrees Celsius max while gaming. GPU was at 76 degrees max. Uh, those are perfectly adequate temperatures, a little bit warmer than you might want, but nothing that's like a real concern for you. Now the $750 build, I'm happy to say, the temperatures actually went down, even though I upgraded to hardware that's actually gonna generate more heat. And I think that is almost entirely due to the fact that I upgraded uh, and added an additional 120 millimeter intake fan here on the side to supplement the 120 that came with the case. For the $750 build, CPU hit 58 degrees C max while gaming, and the GPU hit 65 degrees C max while gaming, even though we're still using the stock heatsink fan. So I thought that was pretty nice too, although I will say that noise was definitely impacted. Since we're using a fairly generic fan here, this is just one I pulled out of my collection, but should be comparable to the Kingwin fan that's linked in the video description. This is a Bit Phoenix. It's just a pretty standard case fan that you would get with a normal case, but spending five to ten dollars on a fan will give you a fan that works but might be a little bit louder. Spending fifteen to twenty-five dollars on the fan would get you a fan that works and is also quiet. The upshot though is gonna be noise testing, so let's quickly listen to that. I set up Unigen Valley to run on a loop, let it run for a while, and then did uh, standard noise testing using my shotgun mic. Here's the five hundred dollar build. And here's the $750 build. Here 
is just a touch of coil wine coming from the 1060. So there you go guys, performance, noise, and temperature testing with this build in both configuration. Let's talk pros and cons. The pros for this build would obviously be price to performance since we're talking about an entry level build. I like the size, it's a micro ATX case rather than full size ATX. So it's fairly diminutive and would fit, you know, if you had a small desk or something like that. You also have upgrade options, which is a big reason why I went with a current generation socket, the LGA 1151 socket. Uh, current generation platform from Intel. With this B150 chipset, you can't overclock, but you can upgrade to other Skylake processors, which are the new and fastest processors, at least on the consumer mainstream level that Intel currently offers. So from the 6100, you can go to a 6400 or a 6500. You could even go to a 6600 or 6700. Don't get the K SKUs because again, you can't overclock and you won't really get much out of that. But if you did go with a Z170 board to start off with, and in my monthly builds video, I did recommend a different version version of this uh, system that has a Z170 board, you can even upgrade to an overclockable processor. Just bear in mind, you would also have to buy a heatsink fan that those don't come with and uh, more on the heatsink fan in just a second. So upgrade options, I think are really important, especially if you're building a new computer, you're building it yourself. You wanna learn how to do it and how to make it better in the future. Those are kind of the main reasons and the main things that I like about this computer. There are a fair amount of cons though and things you should consider and be aware of if you're building in this system. One would just be all of those little things that make me kind of appreciate really expensive hardware, not to sound too uppity about my PC hardware or whatever, but a $40 case just isn't gonna give you all of the accessories and amenities and ease of use that a $80 case or even a $150 case would get you. So spending a little bit more can get you more stuff as has been pointed out extensively in the comments on these videos. Uh, the, the case as well, I mean, it's a budget case. so. You don't really get as much cable routing. Uh, there's no dust filters included. Uh, the motherboard is also a budget mother motherboard. Being a B150 chipset, you can't overclock uh, the processor if you get an unlocked SKU processor. You can't even really plug in XMP settings uh, to set your memory up to a faster speed, for example. It's also using a stock heatsink fan, which I try to avoid at all costs if I can, but for a budget build, it just makes a lot of sense. Um, it's a 20 or $30 investment in a heatsink fan that you don't need to spend. You also have a lack of advanced upgrade options in this one. So again, the overclocking, overclockable CPUs, uh, the amount of space that you have in the case. I have two drive mounts here that I've used. There's two five and a quarter inch bays up here that you might be able to wedge something else in there, but you're really kind of hitting the maximum of what you can fit in here. Aesthetics. It's not the prettiest case. It's, it's a very standard boxy case. There's no side panel window. My cabling from the power supply has ketchup and mustard going on there and everything. So yes, it's not pretty, but you don't stare at your computer while you use it. Well, some people do. Anyway, I'll leave that up to your decision. Finally, uh, you don't have Wi-Fi as well, but that uh, flips back to the pros for this. And the reason I went with a uh, micro ATX instead of a mini ITX build with this is you do have a couple expansion slots down here at the bottom. So if you needed Wi-Fi, you could pop in a Wi-Fi card. If you even wanted to set this up as like a capture computer, you have an extra slot down there. So you could pop in like a capture card, TV tuner card. There's other things you could do with the system besides just making it a gaming PC. So I like that room for expansion as well. Finally, I wanted to address at least a couple questions that uh, came in on the other videos I posted about this. Uh, the first one directly is from Moist Twinkie, which is a fantastic username, by the way. He just asked, if I change the motherboard, do I still need to reinstall the OS? I recommend if you're doing an upgrade from a motherboard or something like that to always do a fresh install of your operating system. It's just a better way to go. But if you change your motherboard and you have Windows 10 already activated, chances are Windows 10 will not activate on the new motherboard. Windows 10 seems to uh, set up a hardware ID for the system that you activate. It then remembers that hardware ID and it, uh, it issues you what is called a digital entitlement. So if I was to, for example, erase the hard drive, reinstall Windows 10 on this and just plug it into the internet, it would activate. Microsoft would say, you have an activated Windows license just by recognizing the hardware that's installed here. So if you swap your motherboard, yes, Windows might suddenly say, this is a new computer now and you need to reinstall your operating system or buy a new license or something like that. But often in those situations, you can call Microsoft and do their activation line and that will work. Uh, quite a few people commented on the fact that this case is ugly and the computer is ugly and I have no 
real response to that, other than that it's a budget system. Uh, quite a few other people said, can I upgrade the CPU cooler? And um, yes, you can, but it would be quite a challenge and a pain in the butt because this motherboard does not have a cutout on the backside of the motherboard tray. So you would have to basically pull the whole motherboard out and essentially rebuild the whole system to put that CPU cooler on there. So again, a lot of stuff that sort of points towards some of the things that you don't get when you're sticking to a budget. But I'm still happy with this build because I think when it comes to entry level PC building, what I'm focusing on is getting a working full featured system with all the individual components sticking to a budget, which is very hard to do once you start to say like, oh, just spend 20 bucks more on the case. And you know, you could get this slightly better graphics card for spending this much more. You got a 6,500 CPU in there, which is about 190 bucks. You could spend 20 bucks more and get a 6,600 or something like that. Start tacking all those on and suddenly it's not a $500 build anymore or a $750 build. It's a $900 build, but you can always say that. You can always spend more money and get better, cooler stuff to put in there. It's all about what you choose to put in there for now, how it works, and what you could potentially add in the future, which is kind of what I was trying to focus on this one. Base, basic PC building is about getting a full featured system together, sticking to that budget, getting good performance and low noise. Advanced PC building, some of the stuff that a lot of people are asking about in the comments that I talk a lot a lot about on my channel uh, is stuff like aesthetics, making it look pretty, overclocking, which a lot of people don't even dive into just because it seems a little bit scary. I have videos on that, of course, uh, but then also there's the aftermarket cooling and liquid cooling that you could get into as well. But those are all like the next steps. These videos are intended to say, if you've never built a computer before and you wanna try it out, especially if you wanna try PC gaming, you can set this computer up, you don't have to invest a ton of money, and then you can start looking at those advanced things to moving on to the next steps and getting yourself an epic build or something more similar to the system that I have going on there behind me. Anyway though guys, that is all for this video. I encourage you once again to leave me your comments and feedback in the comment section down below. Please go ahead and hit that like button if you enjoyed this video and it helped you out because that helps me a ton. Uh, there's also links down there to my store where you can buy shirts if you're interested. Again, all the parts I've used here, links to the other videos in this series for uh, those of you who haven't watched them yet. I really hope this has helped you guys in your PC building adventures. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.